as you can see, our uh, perspective from other states is incredibly important for uh, New York State, given that this is a new disease that we're working on. Uh, specifically, if you, if you saw those slides with the, uh, whole, state, the whole nation on it, um, you'll, you might have noticed that Pennsylvania is our only adjacent state that has oak wilt right now. Um, so our, I can tell you that our neighboring states are looking to New York to see both how we manage it and uh, they're very encouraging and hopeful that we will manage it well. Uh, so on that point, uh, our information that we're getting from uh, folks, specialists in other states is really important and our next speaker uh, embodies that. I met uh, Bill McDonald last night. He and his wife drove through the terrible weather 12 hours. I was very impressed uh, with their enthusiasm towards being here and grateful for that. Um, so Dr. William McDonald is a professor of plant pathology at West Virginia University. The position he holds was created in the early 1950s because of the threat that oak wilt presented to the eastern forests. While still involved with the study of oak wilt disease, the majority of his time currently is devoted to the biological control of chestnut blight. He has entered a semi-retirement phase of his career but still maintains an active research role with graduate students and is professionally involved with several plant health related organizations. Dr. McDonald will present on his experiences with oak wilt in the mid-Atlantic region. Thank you, uh, Bill, and <laughs> you're welcome. Here. You all are going to be wilted by the time this is over. <laughs> as long as we don't smell like that. That's right. Well, now wait. After, after teaching for over 40 years at West Virginia, uh, I always would ask the students what this smells like. And it's overwhelming that they agree it's like a ripe uh, cantaloupe. And it is. It's a very, very attractive smell, I think, when you find a fresh mat. And, as someone indicated, you can walk up to a tree with oak wilt, and a lot of times you smell the tree. Jennifer, I think you made this point. You smell the tree if it's got good mats on it before you find the tree. So it's, a, I think, a very fragrant fungus and very unusual for a lot of different fungi to smell that good. Um, I appreciate the invitation, Marge. I'm impressed with your New York crew. Uh, you seem to be on track. And uh, that's good to see. Uh, I owe my career, I guess, to oak wilt. Uh, this was a disease that appeared uh, on the heels of, well, chestnut blight, Dutch elm disease, and then along comes oak wilt. And if you read some of the early uh, writings about oak wilt, everybody said, oh, here we go again. That has not been the case so much in the eastern forest. But nevertheless, it's a disease, I don't know any pathogen that has the potential to kill a tree as rapidly, I should say red oak group, as rapidly as uh, Ceratocystis fagaceum. You could put 20 spores into a limb, a uh, small limb on many red oaks and they will be dead in 30 days. Uh, but fortunately, with that alarm, it doesn't get around very well. And therein lies the problem, and Jennifer made the point about the disease being different in different areas, and that's one of the points I want to stress today. Uh, you all don't know what you face here in Long Island, because it's early in the disease situation, and it may be less of an issue than we have. It may be more of an issue. It's something to keep track of. So let's get started, and I'll go through... Wrong way? Ooh, here we go. We, we, you've got a great here crew go. here. This is a map from a fairly f famous publication as far as we're concerned in West Virginia. It was Oak Wilt in West Virginia. The title, I should have a picture of the, of the book, but it was one of the most comprehensive biological treatises on the disease published back in the 60s. 
Uh, and this is what the disease looked like at the end of 1957. Uh, you saw some pictures, I'll show you some pictures of a more recent situation, but the disease was discovered in the, the county that West Virginia University is in, is, whoa. Mason-Dixon line. I knew that would happen. <laughs> we're, we're still on. <laughs> and my predecessor at the university, I asked him when I became a faculty member there, when did you first find oak wilt in West Virginia? He said, the day I drove back in from a meeting on oak wilt in Wisconsin. <laughs> and the disease occurs with some regularity in the state, but it's not a real common issue. So we now know that this particular region, the eastern hardwood forest, has really a little different perspective than many of you might face, uh, in, certainly in the Midwest, and perhaps we know about Texas. Okay, this map you've seen, this was 2009, and oak wilt, the concept was it didn't occur to the northeast of the Susquehanna River. There were studies at Penn State to determine why it didn't occur to the northeast, and there wasn't any reason why it shouldn't occur to the northeast. The beetles were there, the trees were there, everything was there, but it didn't occur to the northeast of the Susquehanna River in central Pennsylvania. So, what happened? Well, we don't know. That's for you all to figure out. Uh, you can see in West Virginia, we have two counties that are still free of oak wilt. Uh, there's actually three showing on this 2009 APHIS map, but there are two uh, counties where the disease has never been found. And I don't think it's for lack of looking. We've got a pretty good forestry staff, and if oak wilt were to surface, we probably would know it was there. Um, Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> that, that's probably a lifelong uh, situation. And down here in Texas, that's another area that when I started working with oak wilt, nobody believed there was oak wilt in Texas. That just wasn't even on the radar screen. Uh, people questioned, what's a disease in Texas? They had all kinds of explanations for it. And now, one of my former students has his hands full with oak wilt in Texas. Now, I can pick out almost any 10-year segment. This was some figures I got from uh, the Department of Agriculture in West Virginia, who was in charge of control programs. Th these were trees that were killed. And this was documented by aerial photo and ground checking. And you can see the, the numbers vary from year to year, oftentimes influenced by uh, whether there's been any spring storms that creates wounds that are critical for spread uh, or something else. We could have taken a, a period in the 70s or 80s or early 90s when there was still aerial surveillance for the disease. And this is about what we faced. And most of these trees are found principally in two general areas of the state. So we're not talking, there were, we, we passed more people than this, or we didn't pass them, we passed us on the Long Island Freeway <laughs> yeah. coming over here last night uh, than the number of trees that ever had contracted oak wilt. We're going to talk about two dissemination modes. This is going to be a review, so you're probably going to have an exam on this <laughs> when I'm finished. Uh, Jenny dealt with this. Basically, we have uh, the nitidule, and I was going to ask her why they call these picnic beetles. Jenny? <laughs> okay. <laughs> exactly. And uh, th that may be one way to acquaint yourself with the sap feeding beetle. And the bark beetles, Pseudopidiophorus, that's always a good one to ask students. Can you spell Pseudopidiophorus? <laughs> um, anyway, these beetles were implicated because there were some areas where mats were not very common. And the question is, if it's not the sap feeding beetles, what else is spreading the, the pathogen? And the scolite, the Pseudopidiophorus, was implicated. And they've tried everything to demonstrate this with very, very limited success. But these beetles do frequent oak trees, and they may very well, in certain circumstances, be vectors. And we've already seen these, and we've seen mats. Um, fresh wounds are the key. There was a publication back in 
oh, I think the 1950s or early 60s in Pennsylvania where a power company was putting in a power line and they cut a swath through the forest by uh, basically taking a chunk out of the trees. It used to be done in, in the old days and many of them were oak trees and every oak tree from which they removed a, a chunk of bark got oak wilt. So the beetles tuned in on them right away. Now it's a unique fungus. I have just found out last night that they have changed the name. I won't even bring that up. <laughs> this is a problem we always, all of us, the, we in pathology have with, with organisms. Uh, it's really a unique fungus and I suspect there's probably good reason for that change. The interesting asexual stage are these asexual spores which are produced in the hyphae uh, we'll call them endokinidia, and they come out oftentimes in chains, they're linked together, and they uh, are, could be the asexual spread. There's also some evidence of sexual reproduction. Once the fungus gets into the tree, and fortunately that's not something that happens very successfully, the fresh wounds are critical, then you get vas vascular plugging, fungus travels through the tree via spores, in, in the, especially the large springwood vessels, and ultimately the tree responds by plugging, by producing these tyloses that are so important in uh, barrel production for keeping the moisture inside the barrel, producing tyloses, blocking the vessels, and the tree basically uh, is, uh, succumbs. So let's take a look at root graft. It's something we work with in West Virginia a little bit. In West Virginia, we have, I don't know if it was a bragging point or not, we got about 56 different hardwood species. Now, yellow poplar and oak are many of the, are predominant ones, but there's a lot of different species. So we've got situations such as in Texas, in some areas of the north central states, where you've got a lot of the same species. In our country, we have mixed species. And we think this has really had one of the biggest impacts on the spread of this uh, pathogen. Root grafts, you've seen this picture. In fact, that may be your photo, Jenny. Uh, I meant to bring, and i sorry I didn't bring a root graft with me. We could have passed around. You all could have pulled on it. But what this does, root grafting does occur where there's a reasonably high incidence of oak, and it produces these small, we call them infection centers. And it may be, the center may be stopped because it runs out of potential other oak trees for the organism to be passed to, or it may smolter for year after year after year. The thing that's always intrigued me and we don't have a good answer for, and I don't think anyone's brought up yet, is a lot of times you won't see an infection center active for several years, then all of a sudden, bingo, the disease crops up again. We call it delayed root graft transmission because the, there was a center there at one point, and for some reason, it hasn't persisted. So we get these open centers that develop as a result of infection. We did some work with this uh, a number of years ago, and this was a five hectare woodlot that had a variety of species, including white oak and red oak, and this was the composition in 1972. And then we went through and followed this 10 years later, and if I back up here, take a look at the red oak component, the white oak component, and the percentage of other species. So here we had 29% red oak, 32% white, and 39 was made up of other species. Ten years later, we're down to 23% white oak, or red oak, 34 white oak, and 43% other species. So we're losing our red oak component in this particular stand. And if we go to 20 years later, after the first data was taken, uh, you can see we've got 17% red oak, 38% white, and 45% other species. And so, so this is what's happened in many areas that we've had a chance to look at where there has been this mixed forest setting and perhaps occasional root grafting, but root grafting that's not uh, excessive where you've got one tree leading to another and to another to another. Okay, what are some of the other factors that affect oak will? We were interested years ago in pathogen variation. This disease occurs over a fairly large range, and we decided we'd take a look and we corralled all our oak wilt colleagues into sending us isolates from their area. 
We didn't know whether there was much variation in the fungus, were there some strains that were more pathogenic than other, others, and uh, uh, a, a, a test had been developed at the University of Wisconsin where young seedlings could be used to test the virulence of isolates. So we had, we had basically seedlings, they were 28-day-old oak seedlings, red oak, and we inoculated them with isolates from two sites in West Virginia, Ar Missouri, Arkansas, Wisconsin, and Minnesota. We had no New York sites, fortunately. And we could find basically no statistical difference in the days between inoculation and when the symptoms were expressed. And we re really felt there was very little difference. And there's been some molecular work done, uh, and it looks like this, this fungus is fairly uniform in its ability to cause disease, regardless of where it's from. Now, the one question I was going to ask uh, Jenny here was, where did this fungus come from? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's been a, a discussion of, 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 of great interest to, to a lot of people that work with Oakwell. And there's the introduced foreign con or, uh, theory, and then there's the native theory. <coughs> So I'm not sure, maybe we can get into that discussion a little bit later. Uh, anyway, we find very little difference. There was some work done at Texas A&M and they found that the isolates were pretty uniform in many regards. So if we look at and compile a lot of the things that have been written about oak wilt, we found for the mid-Atlantic area, there were three particular uh, items that appear to influence the incidence of disease. Topography being one. Where does the oak stand? Where, where, is it, where does it exist? The elevation, and those two are obviously interrelated, and the species composition, which hopefully that's a take home message here for you all. How many oak trees are there? What's the potential for root graft spread? So if we look at the, a topo map, this is in the Ridge and Valley area in West Virginia, we find, and this is, looks kind of scattered, we find that most infections appear at higher elevations. And we think it has something to do with the, the disease not only being there to start with, but probably that higher, those higher elevations trapping more insects and overland spread. Uh, and we, 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 we pretty well know that a lot of these insects are influenced by wind currents and so forth. So we tend to get higher incidence on higher elevation sites, particularly ridge tops. So what are our control options? Now, this is a, a bit of a repeat. We can control mat production and we can sever root grafts. So controlling mat production was one of the, the early efforts that were made by a number of different people in the, in the realm of research. And we have now a, a technique that was de developed by uh, at West Virginia University, along with our Department of Agriculture, has now been dubbed over the years the West Virginia Deep Girdle. <laughs> <coughs> and it was a situation where the tree was girdled, and we had some forestry folks in the, our field crews that could produce a perfect deep girdle. Exactly level with the ground, all the way down, girdling into about uh, two inches the stem, they would tag the tree and take a sample out of the base of the tree. Okay, and that would be tagged as to a number, and a notice would be put on the tree, this tree has oak wilt, do not cut it. And what was the purpose of the deep girdle? This is the first quiz question. Any ideas? What's that? N no, not to stop the spread. I mean, that makes, that's a logical suggestion. Uh, what about it? Well, that's well, that's where it is. But the the girdle was thought if these if these mats and pads were so important in the spread of Ceratocystis dyspegesiarum, why don't we figure out a what method to, to eliminate their production? And this was a technique basically that was was developed uh, long before I ever appeared on the scene. And essentially, the the objective was to dry out the tree. Uh, and it worked well, and it was published. They almost never find any mats or pads on a tree like this. So this was put, implemented in West Virginia as the control for oak wilt. 
for probably 15 years. Uh, it was a real concern. Uh, oak is an extremely important resource. We're the second most forested state, and it's a bread and butter tree in the state. So the deep girdle was implemented, and this was chosen. So whenever a tree was discovered, usually by aerial survey, and spotted by ground, they would go in, and whoever was doing the girdling would girdle the tree, they'd tag it, they'd take a sample out of it, and that particular sample would be confirmed for Ceratocystis vacaceae. Uh, my colleagues in Pennsylvania, uh, again, long before I was at WVU, decided the other, uh, other possible way to do this is to take the tree that had, had oak wilt and cut down every tree within root graft proximity of the tree that had oak wilt, eliminating the potential for spread. Well, uh, my counterpart at Penn State, God rest his soul, he's pushing up daisies now, but he said, we controlled oak wilt in Pennsylvania. We cut every oak. <laughs> and for every, I think he had figures, for every oak that had oak wilt, there were probably eight to 12 trees that were cut besides. So that was the Pennsylvania method, and I'm not sure it uh, served any better pay purpose maybe than the West Virginia deep girdle. But along about, oh, I guess after this had been in, in, in place about 10 years, the folks with the Forest Service, uh, the Delaware, Ohio lab, asked if we wanted to participate in a study where we compared uh, deep girdle, the incidence of disease, in areas, quadrants of the state where this was in practice versus quadrants of the state where it wasn't practiced. And we said, sure, everybody was afraid to, to not use the deep girdle because we thought this was a, con a viable control measure. So the, everyone agreed, we'll do it, we'll let part of the state go and just let oak wilt run its course. We'll, let, we'll take another area, a fairly large geographic area, and we'll deep girdle. Anyone want to guess at the results? No difference. So it wasn't too many years after that that the state of West Virginia decided to table the, the deep girdle concept. Uh, Pennsylvania had eliminated their system too because they'd cut so many oaks it probably never would have contracted oak wilt. Um, anyway, uh, this particular procedure works and the research showed that this eliminated mat production and that was one of the reasons the group at the Forest Service at the time started looking for another vector, specifically looking at the oak bark beetle as a possible explanation for the spread of oak wilt. Um, in any event, uh, this is a picture that looks familiar. <laughs> it's amazing how these things get around the, <laughs> the oak wilt community. This is not West Virginia. It's far too flat. Uh, Jenny, do you know where this picture was taken? Okay. So all of a sudden, root graft control seems to be pretty important, regardless of site, particularly on the sandy soils that uh, Jenny had mentioned. And this is a good example of go into this situation and try to sort this out. Anyway, it takes a lot of strategy to figure out where you're going to put these barriers. Jenny presented one concept, but here you've got a situation where you have to, I think, decide where the oak wilt killed trees are, where are the other potential trees that might be killed, and decide where you're going to put these barriers. So it's a little bit of a problematic issue. Where do the barriers need to go? Uh, okay, she showed you a vibratory plow, which was used in Minnesota. This is another picture. These are some pictures I've acquired from colleagues, because we never did this in West Virginia. There was no way to use a vibratory plow. There was no way to use almost any piece of equipment in West Virginia. It, you run into rock. And uh, that is just simply a situation where you have root grafts, but there's no way to get to them. So that was one of the reasons Pennsylvania went to cutting trees all around the infected tree, thinking, well, we can't really sever root grafts, so we'll cut down the potential new hosts. And then I've, one of my former students, uh, this, is, this is how they do it in Texas. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe it, but David said, and I think they've got some evidence that the root systems of Texas live oak are really deep in the soil. 
So they felt they had to go to this particular piece of equipment to sever root grafts. And it does a job. But this wouldn't work in the Appalachians either, uh, unless you had an infinite number of blades and infinite amount of time. Anyway, uh, that particular piece of equipment is, uh, should be in everybody's backyard, right? <laughs> okay, so what can we sum, sum over here? The spread of disease is very slow and erratic in the Appalachians. Insects are, are really the overland vector, but I think they really depend on the, fr the fresh wounds and mat production, although we, ha we weren't able to show that ex extremely well. Root graft transmission, I think, maintains more of the infections than we give it rise for, but it's slowed by the diversity of the species that inhabit a site. Uh, it's also slowed by this phenomena of delayed root grafting. What happens if you have a tree here that dies this year, and maybe eight years later, a tree next to it dies? And it's almost invariably connected somehow, but there was some period of time that was involved between the two deaths. Okay, and then topographic features, including slope and elevation, certainly influence disease incidence. Okay, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Has anyone tried to use gastroenterology mass spectroscopy and nuclear magnetic resonance to identify the chemicals, the actual chemicals in sleep smell, what, what sort of volatile organic compounds are being released? By the, uh, that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, been done, but we're taking that into Gordon and Bell. Ketones and alcohol. Yep. Alcohol and what? Ketones. Ketones and alcohol. Yeah. They, they, they tend to smell quite a bit. And there's, these compounds are found in indoor air quality problems in buildings as well, due to fungi and mold inside duct work and air conditioning systems. Other questions? Okay. With the removal of these trees in uh, Virginia, Minnesota, were these trees used for lumber? Could they be used for lumber? Well, I, I didn't get into that. We, there was great interest in oak wilt from the standpoint of the disease internationally. The Lumber Exporters Association had spent decades developing a significant export market for American oak. And all of a sudden, oak wilt raised its, reared its ugly head and they were faced with what happens to our export market. So they supported a number of institutions, Minnesota and West Virginia, to take a look at its survival in lumber. And we tried a number of different things, including air drying lumber, and we found that the fungus survived for a long time, remarkably, in, in cut boards with the bark on them. Uh, so that created a problem so basically that's why uh, the industry has had to go to fumigation. And Jenny, you may want to comment on this because you've been involved recently. Fumigation of both logs and lumber before it's exported uh, to other markets. You have some comments? It's required. Yeah, that's a robot fumigation that's required for export. Yeah. We're currently working on a distinct entry on what the bill says that we're looking at other treatment of, of oak logs that are destined We tried desperately for about four or five years working with APHIS and the European Economic Community, as it was called then, to let them let logs from counties that were, had no identifiable oak wilt be exported. 
And they caught on real fast because all of a sudden it looked like most of the logs were out of West Virginia were coming from Tucker County. And it's amazing how you can adjust your exports based on county. So. A boat ride over the pond and coming back, right? Exactly. Same thing. Yeah. Is that correct? You're exactly right. Yeah. Go ahead. Will, will, will um, composting the, uh, you know, once the wood is just ground up and composted over a certain temperature, will that, will that kill the fungi? Well, again, Jenny, you're, you've done some of that. Well, I haven't done an actual study, but we know that the <laughs> fungus is a poor sacrifice. It's a, it's a very less pathogen, but once the tree dies, it's within a standing tree, it's very quickly replaced by other fungi and, and even bacteria and other things. And um, so I would suspect that in, in um, if you use, you know, oak will free, the logs would then grown up for mulch or whatever. I, I don't think the fungus would survive very long. So we're not concerned about it in Minnesota anyway. Yeah. And, and I think didn't, um, Skip Amos did a study actually, and, and even Alex Sago, one other fungi, Right. So I think the evidence supports that it's not a concern anymore. Yeah, as we were talking earlier, I think some questions were asked of Jenny about isolating from trees. And some of the studies we've done, we were looking at the different mating types of the fungus uh, in West Virginia. And we found we could go back about a month or a month and a half after the tree was diagnosed as being symptomatic. And we invariably went down and took samples out of the buttress roots because the, the fungus is just simply not a good competitor. You get much higher than that, and within weeks, it's not recoverable. So if we went down and pulled some of the soil away and took a chop out of the buttress roots, you almost invariably could retrieve the fungus. And that's basically what our state program was. They would always sample low, right to the, near the ground, and there you got good pretty good recovery. I was, you know, well over 50% of the samples would come out uh, positive. Uh, but time is a real important factor. How soon, how long has the tree been dead? Get these freshly symptomatic trees and they're, you can pretty well isolate from them. Certainly not so much from the crown though. Go low. Okay, other questions? You've been a very attentive audience. Um, Mark. <clears throat> when you watch these um, events of oak wilt outbreak, along with things like gypsy moth, have you had a gut feel for interaction in in that situation, or or any other interaction kind of thing? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and we kind of ask ourselves what happens. Gypsy moth had been moving down toward West Virginia and is in West Virginia, but we thought this is really going to mask oak wilt. Mm -hmm. And I think it probably would have masked it significantly. But all of a sudden, gypsy moth has ceased to be much of a problem. It's being controlled uh, biologically. So we, we don't have, uh, so we didn't have significant gypsy moth defoliation. Now, southern Pennsylvania did, and it just seemed almost like it stopped about the time, or slowed down when it got to the Maryland border. Yeah, Mason-Dixon line. But that's a great, so if we wanted to study oak wilt in the absence of gypsy moth to go into central and southern West Virginia would be a place to do that. It would be. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Any idea about the rate at which the root uh, transmission would occur in a forest uh, per year? Like what we, we could expect for a rate for something like Long Island for spread? Well, I think it's highly dependent on what you have there in terms of the oak population. Mm -hmm. uh, Jenny talked a bit about inter and intraspecific root grafting, and I think it really uh, depends on your species composition, is a point I tried to make. And um, if you've got stands where, there are, where there's a lot of oak, mm -hmm. I think you've got a problem, more so than a stand where you've got a diverse population mm -hmm. of trees, species, yeah. Environmental factor that would make it worse as a drought, make it worse, or high rains, which would bring on bacteria and fungus. Like, is there a, a note on the conditions? Because we just went through a couple of years of drought, and this year was especially wet. So, 
So is there a, a condition that was, was exacerbated? I don't know that that, w I can't speak to that as far as oak wilt goes. I think what would happen is basically you'd create conditions that, as it was explained before, that maybe mimic oak wilt. And that's where the confusion might rest. I don't know, any comments there? I would, I would agree, especially a drought followed by two months of them for Yeah. And that's really problematic for us to distinguish between that disease and oak wilt. And I think the other thing you need to be aware of too is bacterial yeast growth. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. It's just amazing, an oak tree, once it dies, from whatever cause, is just colonized by a whole variety of other fungi very rapidly. Uh, one point that Jenny made about discoloration, we, we almost hardly ever see any vascular discoloration associated with freshly killed oaks. And that's one thing that's bothered me a bit because we get reports that discoloration of the outer sapwood is, is common, even albeit not like Dutch elm disease. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know what it is about where we are in the central Appalachians that's different than other areas, but that's not something I really tend to associate with oak wilt after culturing thousands of samples from dead or dying oaks. One thing I kind of was thinking was interesting too was thinking about Sandy, Hurricane Sandy and what kind of wounding that did to a lot of trees. I know there was a lot of damage seen immediately, but also, you know, why were we seeing this so widespread? It was it just a couple of years after that major storm? And I wonder if that had any, anything to do with it. If you take a look at our state figures, you can pretty well, there, there's a, a weak correlation with years we've had a lot of spring storms mm -hmm. and the incidence of there's a lot of damage, physical damage to the trees, the incident tends to go up a bit. Yeah. Makes sense. Fresh wound, that's the key. So Therefore, any the Long Island Power Authority should not prune trees between April and June. Oak trees. They've got to establish a policy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And someone's gotta be able to tell them that you can't do that. Well, you know, I think many of you learned in school I don't, about tree wound dressing, that it was kind of, Shiger says it's a no-no, but all of a sudden it becomes maybe not such a bad idea if there's pruning being done in the spring. I don't want to recommend that, but. Yes? I would guess so, not knowing the climate here that well, but I would think there would be a, a shift, especially if you compare it to South Dakota. <laughs> That's where he's from. Yeah. yeah. Also, we've looked at Missouri and it does shift to further south. Yeah. And in Texas, it's February. You know, we found a call off this one to press the end of February in Texas. Yeah. And in Missouri, it's a mid to late March. I would say it has to be pretty fresh. Jenny, you gotta, she's, she's just the woman who's worked with fret wounds and more, more than anybody in the world. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, right, that's the key. Exactly. I uh, have t two colleagues at the University of Maryland who 
there's been this resurgence of interest in oak wilt. It's kind of amazing to those of us that are in states where it's kind of, yeah, it's a problem, but you know, you have to look for it. And they both wanted to come to West Virginia to see oak wilt. And I said, no problem, I'll be glad to show you. So I had three sites picked out that were classic oak wilt sites. <coughs> Fortunately, I said, I told uh, them to wait till I went and checked them first because I didn't want them to drive over to our eastern panhandle. I went over and found one was a subdivision. <laughs> <laughs> the other one apparently had been logged and I could not find any site with oak wilt. Now, I just maybe wasn't at the right place at the right time, but it was a little bit embarrassing, so I had to call them. I said, let's schedule this for next spring. <laughs> and I called the foresters in that area, and they said, well, you know, when we had an oak, active oak wilt program, they kind of knew where the oak wilt sites were. They didn't know where there were any oak wilt sites. And we had Europeans in when we were working with this export issue, and they expected to get off the plane in Morgantown and see the forest dying. <laughs> and after we spent an hour and a half driving to the closest oak wilt site that we knew about, uh, they, they were impressed that the disease wasn't quite the same thing they'd read about. But I don't want to minimize the importance of oak wilt. Uh, certainly, uh, it is an unbelievable pathogen, or ceratocystis is an unbelievable pathogen, given the right circumstances and given the right host. So. Anyway, it's unbelievable in its ability to kill trees. Do you think that oak wilt came in because the eastern forest, which had a huge component of chestnut, broke up the stand so that you didn't get the transmission of uh, fungi from one tree to another, less root graft, when the original forest was mostly chestnut? That chestnut died, and the, all of a sudden the oak's coming back really big, and then you're getting uh, a well, that's a good point because our forests, no matter where you are, pretty much in this country, they have been altered by man a great deal, enormously. And uh, I don't think any of us have discussed the fact, and I think one of the reasons this disease appeared on the scene in the first place was the fact that you have stands of, well, white pine in Wisconsin in Minnesota that were cut over. What came back? Oak. And all of a sudden you had a susceptible host population that enabled this particular pathogen to surface. I, I kind of wonder if oak wilt would have ever been discovered in the central Appalachians unless somebody was out there looking for it and there was some reason to look for it. Because a lot of trees have been saying, well that was a lightning strike, that tree died because of lightning. Uh, so I think its discovery really depended on the fact that it emerged as a disease in the upper Midwest. And the same thing can be said for Texas. If you talk with the folks down there, you'd say, all of a sudden, we had a lot of Texas live oak growing in these connected moths, they call them, the sprout populations that develop in Texas, and they start spreading through those. Why? Because a lot of, a lot of ranches, it, they, were, they were no longer ranches trees grew up in their place and so forth. So the scenario was ideal for the, the disease to emerge there. Okay, great, thank you very much.